probably ought to go ahead and um, get started just so we don't keep everybody too terribly long. And, you know, material wise, this one isn't, there, there's not just a ton there because really it's, it's kind of a continuation of what we talked about last week. Um, last week we talked about how important it was to have adults in the lives of our kids. And, you know, that still absolutely holds true. Um, this week focuses, it, it kind of narrows that subset a little bit, not just having adults in the lives of our kids. It kind of narrows in and focuses on, older adults, grandparents and other older adults within the congregation. And this is, this is something that's kind of near and dear to my heart. I mean, there's over the years that I've been in the church, um, there have been several older adults that I've connected with and really enjoyed their company. Um, and, and there were some awkward conversations that came about as a result of, you know, the, the older people and the, the lack of filtering. Um, I, I got told all kinds of, you know, colonoscopy stories and all kinds of just absolute horror stories. Um, but there were a lot of real, that's funny, no pun intended. Um, there were a lot of really cool things that came about from those relationships. And, and I've saw those really kind of blossom in other people as well. Um, that's one of the things that I've, at different times in, in my time in ministry, um, we've had different different ways to connect our, our older people with our younger people, um, whether it be through intergenerational game nights or uh, through service projects like a, a food pantry ministry and all, all kinds of other things like mixing those relationships has been a really, really um, good thing. I've seen a lot of good come out of it. And those of you in that have been in Farmington for a long time, um, like 20 years or so long time, can probably remember Miss Nadine. And, you know, it's, it's funny now we just live down the street from where she used to live, but I will never, I mean, until I die, I will never forget Miss Nadine's birthday phone calls. Like that was just one of those things every morning or every morning, every year on your birthday, you'd get a phone call about seven o'clock in the morning and it would be Miss Nadine singing happy birthday to you. And I, I, I don't know, because I never answered the phone at seven o'clock in the morning. I was usually not awake at seven o'clock in the morning. But when I would get the phone call, when I would actually end up on the phone, she wouldn't ever say anything. She would just start singing happy birthday. And from what I've gathered, she's done that for almost everybody at, at Farmington. That was just her thing. And there was no mistaking the love that you felt from, from Miss Nadine. And, it was just awesome. So I, I loved, I loved that sort of interaction. And, you know, as I've gotten older, there's lots of other meaningful things that have came from um, those older adult relationships that I've been able to have, but it was just something that stuck in my mind. And, and hopefully when I get old, I can do that too. Um, at least do something memorable. But in the, in the book, back to the book, um, it talks about how important it is to have those relationships between our, our teenagers and our older adults. And, and in the, not in this book, but in the actual sticky big book, um, they talk about how there, there's a lot of similarities between our teenagers and our older adults, um, our, our senior adults. Um, both of them have this tendency, at least within the majority of congregations, to feel kind of marginalized, kind of pushed to the edges, um, because they're seen in some places as less important. Uh, you know, teenagers are kind of pushed off to the side and in their own group, and, you know, our, our seniors, our golden agers, um, kind of have their own group, and they kind of feel like they're on the fringe, so um, they do kind of share that in common. But more than that, it's easier, or at least in my experience, it's easier for teenagers to connect to grandparent-aged people, to those senior adults, than it is for them to connect to um, people their parents' age. Because it, there's just something about that, that age demographic, I guess. Because you see other adults kind of like the way you see your parents. And as well, all of us know, 
the way that we interact with our parents is quite a bit different than the way that we interact with our grandparents. And, and that's kind of a universal truth that there's this uh, special tenderness is the, the way they phrased it in, in the big book um, between teenagers and adults, because there's that, that loving relationship. So it's just a natural connection um, between our, our older adults and our teenagers. So, and, that, and that's something that we should really kind of uh, capitalize on do the most to encourage those sorts of relationships. I mean, and again, it's, it's a biblical thing. You know, throughout scripture, we see this, this charge for our older Christians, uh, whether they be men or women, to mentor, to teach those younger Christians. So it, it carries, you know, throughout scripture, it carries with common sense. We see, you know, the, the way that we interact um, between grandparents and teenagers. And we also see some similarities that, that fit. So any way you look at it, it's, it's a good thing, but it takes effort sometimes. It just takes a, a little bit of work. So now that I've kind of introduced the, the whole chapter and section and talked a lot, um, I want to see what, what really like stuck out to you in the reading. Like what, what was the, the most meaningful thing that you came across? Then we all kind of come at it from different perspectives. Well, I guess I just thought about how um, thankful and grateful I am for my parents. Um, I just think they're both great grandparents to my kids and to my sister's kids and brother's kids. And I was just, I can just um, see the influence that my dad has had like on Jonan and um, I don't know. I just, as I read it, I was just really thankful for my parents and getting to live next to them and the influence that they get to be on my kids. Yeah, that's, I mean, and that really is a special thing, especially when you're so close that they're, they're constantly in one another's lives. And, and that's something that's good for both of them. I know for, for us, you know, we, we love central Arkansas. That was, that was home uh, as much as you can love central Arkansas, I guess um, we, we enjoyed it, but um, it, it, it was home, but our big draw was coming back up here so that our boys could be closer to their grandparents. We wanted them to have that relationship because it, it was important to us and, you know, we want it to be important to them too. So, um, I definitely see that as, as something important. Um, yeah, what else? So I think one of the things that also stood out to me, um, the opening story about Miss Ruth, who yeah. wrote the letters every week, um, like that story to me, I, I thought was also very instructive um, because, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to have wonderful, incredible, godly grandparents I spent a lot of time with. And tremendous spiritual influences on me but more than just that I also had those people in our congregation and so as I was reading that I was thinking about some of those people when I was a teenager who served that kind of role and uh, the impact they made on me and those same kinds of people uh, after even since then uh, one thing, it reminded me something my grandmother has always told me, uh, is she's, she's always told me in, in ministry to never forget the old people. Because if you make a friend with an old person, you have a friend for life. That, that they are the kinds of people who will stay there and support you and be there to encourage you. Whatever may come, uh, you know, we don't always, you know, keep friends forever, but uh, things happen and relationships get broken and whatnot. But uh, that's always kind of stuck with me. Uh, and, you know, I've seen that. One of my favorite things at Farmington is, is uh, driving the bus for the golden agers to go places and things. And y'all, they're kind of out of control. I mean, I have had to pull the bus over before, but like, uh, it's a blast. And uh, I think 
I think it's easy for those groups to sometimes be overlooked in congregations and they have a lot to offer um, a lot of us. Absolutely. You know, that's, I, it was funny that you mentioned driving them in a bus because that, that was one of the most memorable things because I, I did something similar with our, our older people at Bologna, except we would do it once a week. They really liked to eat. So, and I like to eat, so we ate very often. Um, we would go out every Thursday and go, go to lunch and write cards and do that sort of thing. Um, but no, it, I, one time they asked me, um, you know, is it more fun driving teenagers or driving the old people around? And if there was a roundabout involved, it was more fun driving the old people in, around because they freaked out at the roundabouts. It was awesome. Um, the teenagers were just kind of, they, they, they didn't care either way. The older people, they would actively instruct me to avoid the roundabouts because they, they were scared. So I don't know, but it was, it was fun. I mean, those memories that, that you make with them are, are always special. Um, yeah. And it was, it, it's, it's one of those fun things. Like there are a lot of things that, you know, we, we take for granted, um, as teenagers, you know, all of our teenagers now spend tons of time on electronic devices. They spend time with video games and all sorts of things. Um, but a lot of the older games are, are kind of, they, they have this novelty about them. So spending time with the older people, having them teach the, the teens how to play um, dominoes or how to play uh, rummy or all sorts of different games that, you know, our teenagers may or may not have ever played, but it, there's just something about getting a group of older people and a few teens mixed in around a table playing Mexican train. Like it just, it really comes alive and you really get to know people that way. So just those interactions, any of that um, social interaction is, is fun. So I guess there's, there's a lot of positives that we can all connect with those, those memories that we've made with older adults um, that were meaningful. Um, do you guys see that as something that's, that's increasing? Are there more of those interactions happening with, with your kids or with the, the current crop of teenagers that we have now? Is it more hap Is it happening more or happening less than it did when we were teenagers? I think that a lot of times, um, or I see it a lot, but like, you know, like people like my age, like 17, 18, or even younger, they just kind of like talk with their own group mm -hmm. or click, whatever you want to call it. But their own little group. <clears throat> but, and then you'll have these odd, odd birds over here, kind of like me, and talk to all these other people, you know. But I think everybody's a little bit different. Yeah. I, I mean, that you're absolutely right. Everybody is different. Everybody you know, has their, their own pull, um, you know, people that they, they like to talk to. And some of us just like to talk. It doesn't matter who's listening. We just want to talk to people. But, you know, some people, they feel really comfortable. They have their little group and they don't want to, you know, venture outside that. But there's a lot of, there's a lot of people, uh, especially in that older category that are just sitting there waiting for somebody to come and talk to them. And it's, it's really exciting when you do that and get to see that light bulb go off for them. I think it's a two-way street, though, uh, and uh, I think, it, I mean, I'm not trying to let teenagers off the hook, but I think there are also some older people who are just better at that than others and who seek those opportunities. So, yeah. like, as Lane was talking, I was thinking about him wearing a cowboy hat that has a feather in it that Bill gave him. Like, that's exactly the kind of thing Bill Beckett would do. Like, Bill would see Lane, this kid in blue jeans and boots, and take an interest in him and show up with a feather for his cowboy hat, you know, and that's who Bill was. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, so I think it's also a, a two way street that uh, older people also uh, choosing to take an interest in, in teenagers and reach out uh, knowing that it's probably a little less awkward for them to reach out than for that teenager to go try to talk to somebody who is that much older than them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the, the, that's kind of a logical transition. Um, one of the things that the book talks about is these types of relationships between teenagers and adults kind of helps those, those older adults to, 
you know, really fulfill this biblical uh, calling that they have, you know, to, to mentor to these, these younger Christians. And the, the quote that was in here said, they cannot move to Florida and leave the church on its own. For Christians, there is no Florida, even if they happen to live in Florida. That is, we must continue to be present to those who have made us what we are so that we can make future generations what they're called to be. Aging among Christians is not and cannot be a lost opportunity. And, and that, that quote is specifically pointed to, to those older adults because there is that, I don't know, kind of that retirement mentality. You're, you're done. You've, you've, you know, you've served your time, whether that be you know, teaching Bible class or, or however you want to look at that involvement. Um, you've served your time and you're done. And the reality is you're, you're not done until you're done. <laughs> you know, it, it's one of those things that we're called to continue to, to live out our faith interacting with others, regardless of how old we are. There is no retirement age. There is no point where you can just quit and coast. We're supposed to do this until the end. And, and that's something that, you know, is, is something we need to hear. Um, but obviously, this, this group here, there's very, very few of those grandparent age groups to hear. Um, I guess... We, we talk a lot about how, you know, this is something that's, that's good and we need to do. What are some ways that you see this already happening? Like, what are some things that you see this happening? I know we talked about Bill and uh, the feather. But what are some other things that, that you see um, our older generations doing now within the congregation? Well, Joe, I thought that we had it set up where people could like um, choose a college student like that's gone off mm -hmm. um, and like send them letters and pack care packages. Because I thought I remember Joan and getting some. So I think that's a really good way. Um, I don't know if it's always older people that take them under their wing, but I think that is a really good idea. Um, I have a memory when I went off to college um, in Oklahoma um, at the Church of Christ in Miami, this little um, old lady, Miss Shirley, like took me under her wing and let me go eat lunch at her house on Sunday afternoon. So, um, so I think we might have people that do things like that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, those, those sorts of opportunities and, you know, this year it kind of got, got, stalled i guess with all the virus and everything that happened but that's definitely something that we want to you know kick up again because any way that we can encourage those connections is worthwhile i mean i know when carrie and i moved to conway we were and i was older i'd already graduated college once at least and we left and we moved down to conway and knew no one I mean, we, we didn't have any connections with the, the church down there. We didn't have any um, real way to belong. And as we spent time there, we, we kind of sought out those relationships and, and we found older people to kind of connect with. And, and it happened. Um, and I'm really thankful that it did because a lot of people don't do that on their own. Um, they, they just kind of sit there and become isolated and get burnt out and just kind of fade into the background. Um, and, and that's where it's, it's up to us as adults and, and also, you know, for our teens, it's up to them as well. We have to actively seek this out, whether that be seeking out young people that need someone in their lives or as a young person, seeking out these older people that you need in your lives. Ideally in a perfect world, it would happen on its own. You would never have to worry about it, but it's not a perfect world. We have to actively do this if we want it to work. Um, so yeah, any, anybody else seeing, seeing this happen in, in our church and in, in ways that we can kind of encourage that to continue? Awkward silence. All right, so 
some of the ways that I see this happening, and it's it's a little different from my perspective because you know when you're when you're in ministry, when you're the minister, it, it looks different. People act different around you. Um, but I, like, there's several times that I've gotten uh, cards either in in our mailbox at church or, or mailed to the house, just little encouraging notes, things like that from some of our older people. Um, I know I've, I've seen several different times where our, our older people got together and they, well, they've had several different times where we've prayed for um, some of our teens in different situations that they were going through. But there's also been times where I've, I've just seen those interactions, just organic interactions that happen on their own, um, where adults will pull a teenager aside and have a conversation with them. They'll either ask them how it's doing, or they'll see something and say, hey, I saw, you know, that you got this award, it was in the paper, or I saw, the, you know, these different things that people notice, and they'll start those conversations with that. So I, I've seen some of those non-structured interactions happen. So that's, that's another thing that I've seen. Um, Robert, I guess I was thinking too, with lads to leaders, um, just the mentors that are um, not always older people, but um, I've seen Gina and Helen, you know, they're interacting and giving girls advice as they're doing the, the different activities. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. That is, I mean, lads to leaders is a great structure that will allow that. And it's, it's kind of a, a two-edged sword, I think, because Lads Leaders is really good at putting structure to this and, and having programs that will kind of facilitate that sort of interaction. But there's the, the other side of that is because it is such a big program, because there's a lot of commitment involved for those adults that, that want to do it, it's kind of scary. And I, and I think, you know, if, if you're willing to do that, that's awesome. But that, that can intimidate some people. So, so trying to, I guess, as, as adults see needs, as you like see a need for someone to help with whatever it is, that's a great opportunity to pull someone else in and, and help them, uh, I guess, not be intimidated by it, um, encouraging them to help. So yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's this, this statement um, that was in there, I thought was really kind of good that said that, you know, our our students today are going to have greater involvement with their grandparents than ever before, really. Um, And and there's several different reasons that it talks about in the book. Do do you guys agree with that statement or do you kind of disagree and why? Mom says that she agrees with it because there's more working moms. Yes. Yes. There, yeah, there's a lot more houses where there are, you know, both parents are working. So when you have two parents that are working, most jobs are not between eight and three. You know, there, there's some time in there where you, you need some help. And whether that be from grandparents or, or other older adults, grandparents are a natural fit because some of them are retired. You know, one of these days we'll have some of our grandparents for our boys that are retired. I hope maybe they may all work till they die. I don't know. But if they do retire, then you better believe that they're going to be involved in our kids' lives because honestly we could benefit from it. Um, but I think it would be really good for them as well. <clears throat> do what now? Oh, I'm it's okay. I think I've All right. Robert, I would say that, um, of course, I'm on the older side of this of this conversation, but I'm not a senior. But I am. A <laughs> um, but even for me, for my grandparents, which I had um, two sets of grandparents, really um, until um, I mean, for a long, long time, but. My grandparents were very influential and very good, very good people, but they weren't involved in my life um, because they were raising cattle in a big garden and making draperies. And um, my grandma Foster 
was still raising babies that were my age. I mean, I've got an uncle that's my age. So um, we were underfoot and were nothing but an irritation when we were little um, because she had kids with her grandkids. And so it's, and then my other grandparents were old, older when I was born. And um, so they were, um, and I know it's a totally different generation, but they were clipping along on the side, just trying to keep things together. And, um, and, and I knew I was very loved and I was very mentored, but it's a totally different level now, as far as, um, the grandparents that like my parents for my kids and Marion's parents for, for our kids, um, they were hands-on childcare for us. I mean, I worked always and they were the childcare. So, and they were at the ball games and the ball practices and the square dance and all that stuff. But where my grandparents were, they were still, you know, tilling the land and doctoring the cattle. And it, it just was a, it's a different, it's a generational thing I know, but um, I think it's totally different. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, like there, there's less, you know, family farms. So there's, there's less of that sort of lifestyle in general. But, I mean, people are, are living longer. Their health is better. Like, there's all sorts of things that, that kind of contribute to, to this role. And, I mean, I, I think it's awesome. And, and not only that, but we've also got all these, um, you know, new technologies. And some grandparents are more involved in that than others. But, you know, even if you're distanced, um, social media and things like that can really shrink that distance pretty quickly. Uh, where it's it's still easy to be involved in the lives of your kids or grandkids um, if you're willing to, you know, kind of adopt some of those tools that are out there. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that, that was pointed out in, in the book was basically that, that involvement in the lives of our kids is equal equals influence so if you're involved then you're going to have an influence um and, and that's something that we we kind of take for granted a lot we we think that oh you know i'm they, they don't really care i i'm i'm older they have people their age they're not really interested in anything that i would have to say but the reality is is you have an influence i mean that there's so much there um that's happening that we're not really aware of a lot of times. You, you don't think about how much your interactions or your conversations can mean to um, those kids that you're talking to. You know, it, it can really make their day for someone to, to know their name. Like I can remember that was, there's several times that I've seen it, but you know, somebody can, can call one of the kids by name and praise them for something. And there's just kind of this little like moment where they're just amazed that, Hey, they, they knew my name. They knew who I was. They knew something that I did. And like, that's, that's meaningful to us. It doesn't seem like a big deal, but to them, it really kind of, it, it makes an impact. So beyond just that, um, our grandparents, especially when they're in the church can have this incredible influence when they're involved. Um, and, and it's it's interesting because if the grandparents are involved and and they're there actively reinforcing um, what the parents are doing, like that's that's another voice, that's another um, credible source that they're hearing the same message from, and and that's that's key because you know repetition is the key to learning. That you have to hear it more than once for it to stick, and and some people have to hear it a lot more than once. But if, you know, your parents are saying it, you might dismiss it. If your grandparents are saying it, well, okay, well, there's two people saying the same thing that's kind of lending a little more credibility. And the more people that pile on, you know, the, the more likely they are to follow that lead. But so I guess one of the ways that this influence can be played out is that, you know, they can reinforce what their parents are doing. But if the parents are absent, and, and that's something that I've, I've kind of always been uh, attracted to that, that group that don't have parents in the church. Um, these grandparents can 
kind of be a substitute for their parents. When the grandparents are there and the parents are not, they're, they're teaching these things, they have a family connection, it's meaningful, and, and they kind of have that, that sort of relationship that, that goes beyond the surface level. So Robert, I, uh, I think in some ways, um, grandparents do serve a very similar role to parents here in the way this happens. Um, in that it doesn't always have to be in the most overt, explicit ways. Um, because in the same way that we talk about like one of the big factors leading to lifetime faithfulness is seeing parents who themselves are involved at church. I think the same thing goes with grandparents. Uh, you don't necessarily like, I mean, I'm not trying to say it's not important for grandparents to have uh, explicit faith conversations with their kids, but sometimes just seeing that is doing the same thing because it's communicating what is important to them. You know, uh, I, uh, I I have very vivid memories. You know, every summer growing up, I'd go spend two weeks with my grandparents. Uh, not that they lived super far away. They lived like an hour away, but I'd go spend two weeks with them during meeting season. And we don't really have meeting season anymore. But back in those days, we had meeting season still, especially in southern middle Tennessee. And, and we were at church all the time. My record was 17 services in 14 days. I mean, we went to a lot of meetings and heard a lot of preaching. But like, you know, being in those situations, and my grandfather was a twin, and we'd go every night with Uncle Merle and Aunt Nita. And like, and so like seeing them to me from like the time I'm a young teenager all the way through till I went to college, same two weeks every summer we, I'd go. And like just seeing those things, it wasn't a question about what was important to them. And they didn't have to say, now, Jared, God is the most important thing in my life. It was clear. I mean, in how they were living and the things they were doing. And, and so I think that's an important thing as well in this conversation, that in the same way that for parents, you speak as much through what you do as anything else, I think grandparents do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, absolutely. Like, that's one of the things that the book, the, the bigger book, the original Sticky Faith book, brings out a lot better than what this one does is – the importance of, of our teens, not just seeing faith lived out, but seeing faith lived out across these different generations. Um, seeing what it looks like to be a Christian when you're, you know, when you're a young adult, when you're, uh, you know, married, when you're, you know, working and have kids, when you're a grandparent, all these things, seeing it through all these stages helps them know what, what it looks like to be a Christian. Um, because a lot of times we, we read scripture and we teach Bible and we have all these Bible classes and it's focused on getting the knowledge aspect. Um, and, and, you know, we try to always apply these lessons, but it always, it always goes a lot further when we see those lessons being lived out on a daily basis. So it, when we see this example from our parents, that's great. When we see it from our grandparents, that's even better. Like the more we build this example into our interactions, the more impact it has, the more our faith is going to stick. Um, and, and that's, you know, growing up, that's one of those things that we have to, we have to look for. Um, we have to find those mentors and people that we can, um, you know, use to, to pattern our lives after really. And, and that's great when it can come from someone within your family. Um, and if it can't, there are others that can fill that role, but we have to be willing to seek those out. Um, so before we move on too far, too far, there were two other things that um, mentioned and how grandparents can influence their grandchildren in, in when it comes to faith. Um, one of the things is that the grandparents can subvert the, the parents' roles, um, the, their parents' influence in their lives. So if grandparents come in at a different angle, they can kind of uh, upturn, cause some disruption in you know, their parents' lives and in the lives of their kids, which as a parent would be incredibly frustrating. Um, and it's something that, that we, I'm really thankful 
um, that, that we have, you know, that Carrie's parents are members of the church and that they're you know, good and active. Um, you know, my parents aren't, but thankfully they're not negative towards the church. They're not openly hostile or anything like that. Um, but there's several conversations that we've had, you know, well, the boys will ask, well, why doesn't, um, why doesn't Grandma Jane come to church? Well, you know, and that's, as they've gotten older, we've been able to have, you know, deeper conversations about that. But questions like that come up all the time. Um, and we try to take those things and use them as teachable moments. But I, it just makes me thankful that they're not trying to undermine us. And, and I know that happens some. Um, and, then, and that's kind of the other category, the other way of influence is just ignoring religion altogether. And that's, that's kind of where my parents fall in. Um, and I mean, we've been able to, to teach around it, um, but it still happens. It's still an influence that's out there. So uh, parents have an influence, grandparents have an influence, um, and those other people within the congregation obviously have an influence as well. So um, I guess it, it is kind of a good thing in that our grandparents or our older generations are um, being more active in the lives of our kids. Um, it's really beneficial. It's, it's a positive thing. But sometimes those interactions can be a little too much. Um, sometimes our, our grandparents can be a little too involved. Has, has anybody ever experienced that, kind of having to tell the, the grandparents or tell your parents to kind of back, back up a little bit, give us a little bit of space? Or am I the only one? Nope. I, I'm more than Gina doesn't have my kids right now. <laughs> Come get them. <laughs> what did you say, Justin? You were broken up. I said, nope. I'm wondering why Gina doesn't have my kids right now. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try to give my kids visitation rights, you know. <laughs> but, but they overstep them sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, that was that was one of the things that we struggled with a little bit when we moved up here it was it was funny you know we we talked to uh my parents it wasn't as big of a deal necessarily um but with with carrie's parents so there, there was these conversations we had it's like okay we we need to establish some boundaries like this this is you know our our time up here we're going to be a family we want you around we want to spend time with you but we we need a little bit of space you know this can't be an everyday thing you know they were ready to place membership at Farmington and jump right in and and it while that is wonderful it's it's nice to be able to have a, a good enough relationship where you could honestly tell them we need a little space like we just went from being three hours away to 15 minutes away let's let's ease into this sort of a, a relationship so you know being honest and being able to have this conversation is is really good um, my grandma took me to my first funeral. <laughs> Do what now? My grandma took me to my first funeral. Well, that's good. I mean, I think I, I, my grandma, I can remember one thing that she said, and it's kind of sad now, honestly, but one of the things that that grandma had said we we never went to funerals as kids like that was something that we we don't do that was something for adults kids don't go to funerals um and we never did we never went to funerals growing up because that was just a lesson that that stuck with me she said you know you you don't want to remember them as they are at the funeral she said, that's that's not what you want to remember you want to remember these good times you want to remember who they were when they were alive and that that has always stuck with me. Um, so I I didn't go to a funeral with my grandparents ever. I think, other than one of the other grandparents' funerals, I think that's the only time that I was together with grandparents at a funeral, um, and that's kind of sad thinking about it. But that's there are lessons that are taught there um, in in those interactions. You know, in the good times and in the bad, you see life being lived out and what that looks like when you know when someone passes. Robert, I think too, um, back to before Lindsay and I got married, 
Marion telling me I will always be here for advice and guidance, but I will try not to interject my opinion on you and your family. You know, that's, that's your family unit. And I've told Lindsay, we've laughed about it. And I said, he's really taken that too far at times because I've, called him on more than one occasion and said, I need your opinion on this. Tell me what you would do. And sometimes he just won't do it because out of respect for me as the man of the house and our family unit, which is, which is so nice to be able to have that honest and open conversation before you even get married. And, and um, I've always appreciated that. Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the things that I've, I've noticed, you know, knowing Marion as an elder and, and being involved in a lot of conversations with him when it comes to something that, you know, like, you know, Justin Lindsay, you guys are involved in lads to leaders or, you know, Rodney now being involved in a lot of the financial stuff. When something comes up, he, he won't speak for y'all. Like he, he actively, like you can tell he's stepping back and going, no, this is, this is their thing. I'm, I'm not stepping into it. I'm not, you know, I'll, I'll wait and ask them. And he, I feel like he does a really, really good job purposefully doing that. So I, there's a, I guess, another great example um, of being able to have those boundaries. I mean, that's, that's important. And that's something that not a lot of families have. Um, it, as Carrie and I, you know, kind of grew up together, um, we got to process through a lot of things, you know, that we dealt with as, as kids, as young adults, as things like that. And that's one of the things that we really picked up on is um, how boundaries are different from family to family and, and how to establish those healthy boundaries. For my family, we all live, like you could literally draw a 10 mile circle and all of my extended family would fit in there. If, if they are alive and related to me, then they fit in that circle. So there's, there's a lot of physical closeness um, that's in there, but establishing those boundaries as to you know, what life looks like, being able to live your own life. That's, that's something that I know we struggled with a little bit initially, and then we moved to Conway and it kind of fixed itself. Um, but we've been able to have conversations with my brother and his wife about, you know, it, for my brother, he was used to it and it was normal. For my sister-in-law, Hannah was not used to that sort of thing. So there were several conversations that we had to have, like, you need to you need to let them know how you feel. If this is if you're uncomfortable with them constantly being over there, be honest. You know, let them know how you feel. And and that's kind of one of the things that we have to keep in mind. Um, you know, we do have to pick our battles, but there are some things that that they're worth having these awkward conversations about. So um, definitely, that's something that was that was good. Um, trying to think through my notes. Um, one of the things that, that was said, or that I guess came across in the reading was this connection between being closer to God and being closer to um, your grandkids. Um, obviously there's not very many grandparents in the conversation tonight, but this this idea that there's a God-given responsibility to be involved in the lives of these younger kids. And it's it's incredibly fulfilling when you ha get the opportunity to do that. Um, obviously, I'm not a grandparent, but I've kind of been able to to be that older adult in, in several kids' lives. And that's, there's just something really good about that. And for... For those of us who are adults, I, I encourage you to, to take that responsibility seriously. But for like the teens that are out there listening to this or those that are, you know, younger than teens, you know, seek out that, that opportunity. Um, one of the things that was said to me when I was younger, I, early on in ministry, there was several things that I tried to do that were going to be expensive. And I did not like, I still don't like. Um, doing any kind of fundraising, asking for money for a mission trip, for um, anything that, that we're doing, I have trouble with that. And uh, an, an elder pulled me aside one time and, and he said, you know, don't, don't look at it as you are asking someone for something. 
So it, you are giving that person an opportunity to serve in this way. You know, you're, you're giving them the opportunity to be a blessing to you and this thing that you're trying to do. Um, you know, in the same way, when we're seeking out, uh, when we're trying to get our teens to connect with these older adults, don't look at it as a way that we're trying to, you know, get the, the kids to go talk to somebody else. We're trying to give them an opportunity for these older people to be an influence on the younger. They're, we're giving them this opportunity to serve in a way that, you know, they may be a little, a little intimidated by. Um, so there's, there's an incredible blessing that they can receive um, on, as older adults. I mean, they benefit from this as well. So I definitely want to mention that. Let's see. All right, so there were several ideas at the end of the chapter, just different ways for, for those interactions to take place. Um, out of those different different things, what sounded interesting to you? Was there anything that seemed um, seemed like would fit for your family or you see that would be you know, beneficial for the congregation as a whole to, to try to implement something along those lines? Um, so our grandparents are up north, so we don't really get a chance to do a lot with them. So the section that talked about connecting for, you know, long distance type relationships to me was kind of interesting. Um, not just in ways I can ask the grandparents to um, communicate with my kids, but in ways for me to communicate towards like my niece or other kids as well, because we're here and the rest of the family is other places. So to me, I could use that for myself, even though I'm not a grandparent, but then also to try and create more of a bond between my kids and my grandparents. We've been talking about it and they're kind of, they don't know them real well because they don't see them that often a few times out of the year. So I like those suggestions. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that's one of the things that I, I've picked up from the, the virus is just the ability that the, the things that technology has allowed to take place that would not have been able to take place before. You know, I see, uh, you know, Jared and his family have, have done amazing at uh, connecting online with you know, grandparents so that Ben has a chance to be around them, whether that be you know, playing Battleship via Skype or Zoom or you know, some of these other things that just, to me, is so cool. Um, to be able to do things like that is, is awesome. So yeah, technology definitely has facilitated some, some cool interactions that can be done via any distance. And whether that be, you know, they're, they're across town and, you know, your kids can't necessarily drive over there on their own, that gives you an opportunity to connect with them that way. But also if they're across the country, you can still do the same thing. So yeah, absolutely. Anybody else see anything cool? I'm a big fan of anything that involves serving together as a family. And so like some of the suggestions about like, you know, obviously we're not really in a time where we're having a lot of things uh, being able to like go serve in a food line and things like that at the local food pantry or whatnot. But I'm big on anything. And they had several of these ideas though that talk about ways for grandparents to serve and do things alongside their grandkids that live out and reflect faith yes that to me some of the the most meaningful interactions you know we at, at Valonia we had a, a food pantry ministry and and what we would do is we would go buy food at the food bank in Little Rock and it would come all jumbled up mixed up in pallets and and I would take the church van and a big trailer and haul back, you know, three, four, sometimes five pallets of food. And during the summers, we would have, every time that I would go, we would have the youth group meet us up there. And the rest of the time when the youth group wasn't free, it was all of our retired people um, in the church that would help out. 
but during the summers, it would be those retired people working alongside the teenagers and they would work together to, you know, sort through the food and put it away. They would work together to, you know, every, every week we would take those groceries out of the pantry and um, bag them up ahead of time. And we would give away, you know, 75, 80 bags of food. Okay, 75 to 80 sets of food. It was usually three or four bags. Um, so it, there was a lot of bagging that we would do. But the most meaningful interactions happened at the church building when we were doing those, those food pantry runs. Um, and and it, I, it benefited the town. I mean, there were people from all around that were able to have, you know, have food for, for meals that they may not have had otherwise. But to me, the real benefit was those interactions. I mean, it was, it was so fun seeing some of those older ladies interacting with some of our teenage girls and, and some of the most unlikely friendships. I, I never would have picked them out, but it, it was just hilarious to watch um, some of those things. And, and it got to the point, some of them had such good relationships. One of the girls, um, she could talk anybody into anything. She had one of the older ladies in our congregation she would bring, make her breakfast and bring it to her at the school um, when she didn't have time to eat breakfast at the house. Like, Kaylin was awesome in that way. Um, but that, that was just, that was just something that she, she made a connection with this lady and they were able to do that. Um, so if nothing else, teenagers, if you're listening, um, make friends with an old person because they usually cook pretty good breakfast. Um, you never know when you'll need a good hot sandwich. Um, but no, there, there are all sorts of opportunities that are out there and service is a huge one. Absolutely. So any, anything else? I already have friends who are old people. Good job, Phil. Good job. Make more. You can never have too many old friends. Robert, I would say going back um, a little bit to what you talked about earlier, our quilting ladies do a really good job of, um, you know, kind of, I don't know how you say it, but just um, ministering to all ages of the congregation. And, you know, I mean, it doesn't matter who's getting married or who's having a baby. I mean, and, you know, just like Richard, he was leaving us, so they made him a quilt. And, you know, you hear about the quilting ladies, and um, you know they do good things, but the minute you unwrap that bag and you look at that quilt and you touch it, and you're like, these ladies, you know, they took the time to cut the fabric, to sew it. Um, it, it just makes it, you know, you have a tangible way to actually appreciate them and realize, you know, these are these are real people and they, they care about me. They took the time to make this quilt for me. Um, so I think the quilting ladies do a, do a great job of fulfilling that role. Yeah, absolutely. And it, and it reaches farther than, than what a lot of times we realize. I know when we were at the children's home, that was one of the things that the, the quilting ladies brought us a bunch of quilts to give to our boys that were there. And, you know, they, they have stuff that, that comes and goes and they'll, they'll have people that bring stuff out to them all the time. But those handmade quilts, like even, you know, these teenage boys, like it was special to them because they could think back to their grandparents and it was meaningful. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a tangible way that you can, you can feel loved. Um, so yeah, things like that carry a lot of weight. Um, and it's to them, they're, they're, they're having fun. I mean, if, if you've ever been in the building when they're quilting, like that they, they're doing it to serve other people, but they're also doing it because they enjoy it. They, they have a blast when they're up there quilting. So it's, it's good for them, but they really are doing a lot of good. Um, yeah, absolutely. So I guess the, the key thing here is sometimes we have to seek out those relationships. Um, you know, as teenagers, interacting with older people seems awkward, but it's still worth seeking out those relationships. As adults, it's worth encouraging, you know, those relationships between your kids and these older adults. 
Um, and, and whether that be noticing the interests that the, you know, that your kid or another teenager has and pairing them up with an older adult that, you know, has similar interests. You know, there are things that as adults, we have conversations with our, our older members and pick up on their interests and things that they're passionate about. And we can connect them with our teenagers that are interested in similar things. So, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of ways that we can do it. Um, and obviously it, it's important for our older people to be involved, but since most of us aren't um, in that category, there are ways that we can encourage others to, to really fill that out, fill that role. So um, that's, that's really good. So teenagers, I haven't, I haven't talked directly to you a lot. Um, what, what do you guys think about connecting with older people? Is that something that you, um, obviously it, it would be awkward, but is that something that you think could be really meaningful to you? I'm completely fine with interacting with older people. That's true. Phil, you're kind of an old soul anyway. You're, you're more mature than most people your age. I, I totally get that. I like to hear a bunch of old stories. Yes. Yeah. And when you find the right old person, you get to hear the same story over and over and over again. It never gets old. Are you referring to my dad? No, <laughs> never. You get to hear a lot of stories with Jim, though. That's... Ron Rogers taught me a lot of stuff. Yes. Yes. I, I can imagine just with with his abilities and his experiences there's a lot of a lot of stuff you could learn from him for sure all right so let's you know we're, we're right at an hour hour in um i think it's been a really good discussion and again this was this was kind of a shorter shorter week in terms of material um but again it's it's just seeing what it looks like to be a Christian across all these age groups, making these connections. And this is, it's the heart of the book. Um, and it's the heart of the idea of sticky faith. If, if we truly want our kids um, and the kids of our congregation to be faithful in the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, um, the, the key is to connection. Um, God, God laid the church out in a way that we're, we're all interconnected. We're all dependent on one another for those relationships. And when we don't have that, there's something missing. And I think that's what we see in a lot of, a lot of the statistics, you know, we've, we've lost the importance of that connection. So I want to uh, just really underscore how important it is to be connected. Um, whether that be as an adult to, you know, other kids, um, yours or others, um, or as a teenager to find those connections. Um, that's, that's the key. So I hope that you've had uh, at least a, a good time reading the book and had fun in our conversations. Um, we'll pick it up again next week and we'll do a little bit more. Um, so we'll be on chapter eight. So uh, unless anybody else has anything, um, let's, let's wrap up and call it a night.